Um, yesterday, we uh, had a chance to listen to two uh, different uh, presentations regarding human trafficking. And uh, these presentations were about Article 4 of the Convention. And uh, forced labor uh, was mentioned. And this is natural, uh, as the two phenomena come hand in hand many times. Um, in my presentation, I will definitely repeat some of the aspects of the earlier, rep uh, earlier presentations, but um, I will talk about Article 4 in a broader and in a more uh, general uh, stance. My presentation uh, will, be, uh, will consist of two uh, main parts. In the first part, I will talk about the notion of the forced labor, the notion of the slavery, the Article 4 itself, and in the second part, I will talk about some of the cases. I think I won't have enough time <laughs> for the cases, so I will write them down in the chapter of our book, but uh, uh, I have to uh, sum up some of the main um, conclusions of the court, uh, of course. So, the first part. What we are talking about when it's about forced labor. Forced labor can be imposed to both adults or children, by state authorities, by private enterprises, or by individuals. It is observed in all types of economic activity, such as domestic work, construction, agriculture, manufacturing, sexual exploitation, forced begging, and so on. These are the main uh, examples. And uh, it's also important that it's in every country. The Article 4 of the Convention consists of three different paragraphs. And the first is, no one shall be had in slavery or servitude. The second is, no one shall be required to perform forced or compulsory labor. And the third is uh, the exceptions uh, from the forced or compulsory labor um, notion. There are four uh, exceptions uh, from this um, uh, institution. Uh, the first is any work required to be done in ordinary course of detention imposed according to the provisions of Article 5. This is the regulation of the lawful detention or during conditional release from such detention. The second exception is any service of a military character or in case of conscientious objectors in countries where they are recognized, service exacted instead of compulsory military service. The third exception is any service exacted in case of an emergency or calamity threatening the life of well-being of the community. And the fourth exception is any work or service which forms part of normal civic obligations. The main, uh, our main task is the elimination of forced labor as a human right. Uh, yesterday, uh, there were presentations about um, the rules of interpretation of the convention. I will talk about it also. Um, the Vienna Convention uh, on the Law of Treaties um, says about the interpretation of our convention. Under uh, the Vienna Convention, the court is required to ascertain the ordinary meaning to be given to the words in their context and in the light of the object and purpose of the provision from which they are drawn. It is really important that Article 4 of the Convention, together with Articles 2 and 3, uh, enshrines one of the fundamental values of democratic societies. And uh, because of this, uh, the Article 4 um, uh, fourth requirement, unlike most of the substantive clauses of the Convention, makes no provision for exceptions and no derogation from uh, it is permissible under Article 15 to even in the event of a public emergency threatening the life of the nation. In interpreting the concepts under Article 4 of the Convention, the court relies on different international instruments. I have to mention the 1926 Slavery Convention, the Supplementary Convention on the Abolition of Slavery, the Slave Trade and Institutions and Practices uh, Similar to Slavery, ILO Convention number 29. This is the, one of the most important. Council of Europe Convention of Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings and the Palermo Protocol, again, uh, in connection with trafficking. 
Since the court's jurisdiction is limited to the convention, it has no competence to interpret provisions of international instruments, though, such as the anti-trafficking convention or to assess the compliance of respondent states with the standards contained therein. So the notions, we have to talk about what we are talking about, slavery and servitude. In considering the scope of slavery and therefore, the court refers to the classic definition of slavery contained in the 1926 Slavery Convention, which defines slavery as the status or condition of a person over whom any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. For convention purposes, servitude means an obligation to provide one's services that is imposed by the use of coercion and is to be linked with the concept of slavery. With regard to the concept of servitude, what is prohibited is particularly serious form of denial of freedom. It includes, in addition to the obligation to perform certain services for others, the obligation for the serf to live on another person's property and the impossibility of altering his condition. And the notions of forced labor and compulsory labor. It's interesting, is there any difference between forced or compulsory labor? According to the literature, we, we cannot be really sure about it. According to the case law of the court, we can find some slight differences between the two. I will talk about it later. Article 4.2 of the Convention prohibits forced or compulsory labor. However, this article does not define what is meant by forced or compulsory labor. And there is no guidance on this point uh, on the various uh, Council of Europe documents relating to the preparatory work of the European Convention. Um, the case law has recourse to ILO Convention number 29 concerning forced or compulsory labor. And from this slide, I have to talk about the practice of the ILO. The ILO has two forced labor conventions which enjoy um, nearly universal ratification, meaning that almost all countries are legally obliged to respect their provisions and regularly report on them to the ILO's standard uh, supervisory bodies. However, not being subject to forced labor is a fundamental human right, um, and uh, all ILO member states have to respect the principle of the elimination of forced labor regardless of ratification. This is also a very important aspect of um, this topic. The main ILO resources that we are dealing with, the Forced Labor Convention, Abolition of Forced Labor Convention Protocol 2014 to the Forced Labor Convention and Forced Labor Supplementary Measures Recommendation uh, from 2014. The ILO Forced Labor Convention from 1930 says that forced or compulsory labor is all work or service which is exacted from any person under the threat of a penalty and for which the person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. So forced or compulsory labor can be understood as work that is performed involuntarily and under the menace of any penalty. It refers to situations in which persons are cursed to work through the use of violence or intimidation or by more subtle means, uh, such as manipulated debt, retention of identity papers, or threats of denunciation to immigration authorities. And some notions. Work or service, all type of work occurring in any activity, industry or sector, including in the informal economy, menace of penalty, a wide range of penalties used to compel someone to work, and involuntariliness, the terms offered voluntarily refer to the free and informed consent of a worker to take a job and his or her freedom to leave at any time. This is not the case, for example, when an employer or recruiter makes false promises so that a worker take a job he or she would not otherwise have accepted. The abolition of forced labor convention number 105 adopted by the ILO in 1957, primarily concerns forced labor imposed by state authorities. I think this is also an important aspect we have to talk about. It prohibits specifically the use of forced labor as punishment for the expression of political views, for the purposes of economic development, as a means of labor discipline, 
as a punishment for participation in strikes, as a means of racial, religious, or other discrimination. I just, uh, uh, I'm just showing you a table. It's a comparison uh, between the exceptions from forced labor according to the convention and according to the ILO as the ILO of the basic uh, instrument, uh, ILO has the basic instrument um, for uh, the convention. Mm, we can uh, uh, think that uh, there is no such big difference between the two. And yes, this is the case uh, in itself. We have to uh, make some distinctions, uh, I'm sure, uh, because um, nowadays many people just uh, mix the notions of uh, forced labor and exploitative working conditions. So forced labor is different from substandard or exploitative working conditions. Those who were present uh, yesterday, uh, there was a story in one of the human trafficking uh, uh, presentation. This uh, story was about a taxi driver in Budapest who thought that uh, he was a victim uh, of forced labor. According to my opinion, he was a victim of exploitative working conditions. Um, so various indicators can be used to ascertain when a situation amounts to forced labor, such as restrictions on workers' freedom of movement, withholding of wages or identity documents, physical or sexual violence, threats and intimidation of fraudulent debt from which workers cannot escape. In addition to being a serious violation of fundamental human rights and labor rights, the exaction of forced labor is a criminal offense Maybe this is the greatest distinction between uh, the two. And the related case law of the European Court of Human Rights. If we take a look at uh, the cases in general which are uh, connected um, to slavery and uh, forced labor, we can see that there are 3,311 3, cases. <laughs> and there are three different topics uh, which does not um, in, ha, have not evoked uh, any cases, work required to be done during conditional release, uh, service exacted in case of calamity, and service exacted in case of emergency. Um, the other topics are effective investigation, positive obligations, servitude slavery, trafficking in human beings, compulsory labor, forced labor, work required of detainees, alternative civil service, service of military character, and normal civic obligations. You can see that uh, there is a difference uh, in the numbers between compulsory labor and forced labor. This suggests that there is a difference between the two, though uh, most of the times it's only the matter of wording. Um, but we will see. I won't uh, go through all of the cases. Um, I know that my topic is about Central Europe, but, but this case uh, against Belgium was uh, one of the most important cases uh, regarding uh, the employment aspect uh, of the convention. So I have to talk about it a bit. It's from 1983, so it's not a fresh case. Uh, but in this, um, uh, this case, the court accepted that the applicant, uh, who was a pupil advocate, had suffered some prejudice by reason of the lack of remuneration and of reimbursement of expenses. But that prejudice went hand in hand with the advantages he enjoyed and had not been shown to be excessive. It had that while remunerated work may also qualify as forced or compulsory labor, the lack of remuneration and of reimbursement of expenses constitutes a relevant factor when considering what is proportionate or in the normal course of business. Noting that the applicant had not had a dispropor disproportionate burden of work imposed on him, and that the amount of expenses directly occasioned by the legal work he performed in question had been relatively small, the court concluded that he had not been a victim of compulsory labor for the purposes of Article 4. There are many cases which refer to this case, not just these aspects, but um, um, but many more. So this is one of the basic uh, cases. 
I gathered some uh, cases from Greece, um, Romania, uh, the United Kingdom, yes, uh, Croatia, Austria, uh, yes, uh, but I don't want to go into details now, um, though I have time, <laughs> but I will sum, uh, sum up those conclusions uh, that is uh, drawn by the court in these cases. So the first conclusion is uh, known by everyone, and I have already talked about it. Forced labor mostly occurs together with human trafficking and discrimination cases. Uh, so this is one finding. The second, the actions of the commandment must be judged in the light of the case law, the practice of the ILO, and many different international legal norms above the convention. So Article 4 itself doesn't solve uh, any cases <laughs> of uh, um, uh, forced labor or compulsory labor or slavery or servitude. Prior consent is not sufficient to exclude the characterization of work as forced labor. That is interesting. The state authorities must take into consideration more types of evidence, uh, even psychological issues regarding traumas caused by the forced labor. This is, of course, really um, difficult for the state or authorities. Um, the threat of a punishment does not necessarily constitute force or compulsory labor. This is the slight difference. Uh, forced labor is a physical or mental coercion, and compulsory labor is compulsory, but uh, um, it cannot refer just to any form of legal compulsion or obligation. So this, this will be the slight difference. Most of the times these are together, but we can imagine cases where there is a distinction between forced labor and compulsory labor. There is no positive obligation for investigating compulsory or forced labor that happens on the territory of another state or does not involve any nationals. This was an Austrian case. Um, yes, regarding the working condition of the prisoners, it can be rightful if the remuneration is given in nature and not in financial form. That won't be a forced labor. And uh, also regarding the cases of prisoners, it can be rightful if they are affiliated to the unemployment insurance scheme, but not the old age pension system. Okay. <laughs> and thank you for your kind attention.